Let me take you back to 2007. Spider-Man 3 is the biggest movie of the year. Kanye West's graduation just took the music world by storm, and Nintendo just smashed the global games market this when they the released Nintendo the DS. Nintendo DS and the Nintendo Wii, shifting the landscape of gaming where six of the top 10 most sold games worldwide now belong to Nintendo. The UFC has slowly been growing in popularity, and after the success of the Ultimate Fighter reality series, the pay-per-view numbers have been exploding. Yippee-ki-yay! In 2006, they broke the industry record for revenue generated in a single year, which means they beat out the WWE and boxing, raking in over $200 million in sales. Roger Huerta was on the cover of Sports Illustrated, and Chuck Liddell made it on ESPN, the magazine. Perhaps more importantly, Mark Ratner has just joined the UFC executive team as vice president of regulatory affairs and helped get the sport of MMA legalized. And Dana and the Fatidas have the opportunity to do something they hadn't done since 2004 release a UFC video game. But the industry itself was in a state of flux, and the creation of a new UFC gaming franchise did not come without controversy. War was declared, lines were drawn, and with the birth of a new era of UFC video games came the collapse of an industry titan and the death of a franchise that is still mourned to this day. With accusations of foul play, insider trading, and an incendiary lawsuit, this is the sudden death of UFC THQ. So, full disclosure, this isn't just a topic that I thought was interesting. This is part of what I do for a living. It's actually how I got connected with the guys here at MMA On Point in the first place. If you've ever wondered why people call me Balian, it's because it's my Twitch name. I also happen to co-own the ESFL, the eSports Fight League for the UFC video games. That being said, I'm in a unique position to talk to some of the best content creators and gamers around the UFC franchise, as well as some of the developers as well. The Undisputed series is obviously one of the most beloved games in the UFC franchise, and I wanted to investigate what happened. And I suppose the best place to start is at the beginning. Chapter 1, A New Era of UFC Gaming The early incarnation of UFC video games were far from true to life. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time! To begin! It all began with the 2000 release of the Ultimate Fighting Championship on Dreamcast and PlayStation, developed by Anchor Inc., former members of the Tekken series team who wanted to focus on developing 3D fighting and wrestling video games. There were no weight class restrictions, the controls were simplified, and it was essentially an arcade beat em up. But it was still released with great reviews. The gameplay was enjoyable, and IGN and GameSpot both scored it higher than 9 out of 10. The Dreamcast version of the game was a finalist for the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences Fighting Game of the Year. But what followed from here was a slow deterioration in the franchise. With UFC Tap Out, Throwdown, and finally Sudden Impact, the games failed to innovate in any exciting way, and as other games franchises evolved around them, new developers Dream Factory did little to advance the visuals or mechanics until the final final iteration. UFC Sudden Impact was given over to developer Opus, responsible for the terrible PlayStation port of the original game, and it was the nail in the coffin for a gaming franchise that sadly didn't seem to have too much of a future. What followed after this was a UFC video game drought, one which wouldn't be broken until 2009 and the release of the first in a new series, UFC Undisputed, which completely relaunched MMA gaming as we know it today. So, you think you're ready for the UFC, huh? <laughs> But how did we get there, and how did developers THQ, known mainly for their franchise video games with the likes of Wayne's World, Nickelodeon licenses, Disney, and their continued development of the WWE series, end up with the keys to the UFC Kingdom? Well, to be fair, THQ as publishers had been supporting combat sports games outside of the UFC since 1997, when they published Darth Coe's K1 The Arena Fighters, and then later the Pride video game in 2003. And that was put out by the original UFC game developers, Anchor, and it got pretty good reviews, with multiple outlets scoring it an 8 out of 10. In the blue corner, from the Ukraine, Eagle 
But for all of THQ's hundreds of licenses, the real leaders in sports games at the time were industry titans EA. They had one of the best selling games consistently every year in the FIFA football franchise, but they also had a whole range of sports titles, including NBA Live, NHL, Madden NFL, MVP Baseball, NBA Street, and more. They of course also had the Fight Night series, the best combat sports game on the market. So Dana White and the Fatidas approached the industry leaders EA to discuss bringing the UFC back to our gaming screens. They knew who they wanted to work with and what EA could provide, but sadly, a deal was never made. Lorenzo Fatida spoke to the Las Vegas Sun and gave an explanation of his version of what happened. We sat in the room with them and I would have cut a worse deal just to be with EA Sports. I wanted them so bad. They looked and they told us they didn't think MMA was a sport. They said the UFC was irrelevant and that we were wasting their time. It wasn't until later at UFC 100 that Dana spoke about that first meeting with EA Sports and he basically declared war. We went to EA and we, we talked to them about it. EA said specifically, straight up, first of all, they wouldn't even take a meeting with us. They wouldn't take a meeting with us, number one. Number two, they said, uh, you know, this isn't a real sport and these aren't real athletes and we'd never do a game like this. So our game comes out, makes a bunch of money, and look at EA. Now they want, oh, now it's a real sport, isn't it? And those, these are real athletes. EA sucks. MMA is not a sport is kind of their cop out. I just, I don't think they looked at the sport as something that would be profitable at the time. I don't think a lot of people cared about MMA at the time, right? MMA was a very niche sport. It was already established on the way up, not what it is now, but it, I don't think a lot of people cared about MMA. Again, because they just didn't really see it for what it it was eventually going to become. But I spoke to several long-standing developers at EA, guys who were around before the UFC even approached the company, and their side of the story is quite different. Uh, many people have asked these questions before and in private and in public. They didn't really come to EA with this big, huge like, hey, we're the biggest sport in the world, you should make our game. And EA also didn't say, well, you're not even a real sport, we're out of here. It's important to know that it was actually fairly benign. They knew somebody who knew somebody at LA or maybe it was even Maxis. I believe they talked to somebody who makes The Sims. Mm. Oh, dang, dang, <laughs> bipso! We don't even know for a fact who it was. We just know it wasn't really anybody in the EA Sports branch or division. Fans had their own views on Dana's quotes about EA though. Was Dana insulted or was he trying to protect the UFC's brand? Some also suggested that EA just simply didn't see any profit in MMA at the time, back in 2007. But that's not what Jason Barnes said, the creative director on Madden and NFL Street. At EA in Tiburon out in Orlando, I had been in the ear of Dale Jackson, our vice president, and executive producer about MMA and in particular about UFC. Forrest Griffin, Stefan Bonner fight was going on and I called him and I said, you have to turn this on right now. Um, this is like the most amazing fight ever. He fell in love that night uh, to the point where yeah. you know, Dale started training, grabbed some other of us. We all started training together. You know, we our goal was to make a splash, right? And get the UFC license. That was the goal when we set out with it. So it was Joshua that got Dale Jackson on board and he was more than capable of leading a sports team as he'd worked on over 15 sports titles as a producer at EA. But when did that EA team find out that the UFC had already approached EA? Well, apparently much later than you would have thought. I was not aware at all. I don't know that when we found that out. I almost feel like we found that out after we launched. I don't remember the exact timeline. Yeah, I don't know exactly when that happened. When he announced and uh, Dana and Dana said something like, well, they can try, but if you're not UFC, you're not MMA and we'll win just the way we win with everything else. He knows the uh, the license that he's got, right? He knows the property that he owns and, and, and he is a face of that. So, you know, he had, a, he had a good reason to kind of make that statement. <laughs> and he's a competitor, so. But in either case, the UFC had in their mind gone to EA to get a deal done. And regardless if it had been the right department or not, they took their business down the road to THQ, where the executive vice president of publishing, Kelly Flock, was more than happy to sign a deal. They were excited about the growth the UFC had seen and working with them to create a competitive sports game. Dana put out statement as well and he praised THQ and their pedigree in the fighting action sports genre. So EA, the leader in sports games, were off the table, at least for now. But THQ had just had their best financial year ever in their 16 year history, reporting in May revenue of over $1 billion. But the tides can change quickly in any digital media. And although a new UFC video game was on the way, the bloom of THQ's financial peak would be overshadowed by a gathering storm on the horizon. Chapter 2 undisputed and in charge. 
Later that year at E3, the first trailer for the future of UFC video games was revealed, with WWE developers Ukes at the helm undisputed showcased as a breakthrough in combat sports technology. <laughs> This was the first true-to-life attempt at MMA in video game format. Some of the earlier titles had been critically acclaimed, but for the first time, striking, grappling, and clinching were all drawn together in one seamless gameplay format. As a fan of MMA, I felt like Undisputed was designed by a bunch of people that were also fans of MMA. It was everything that Dana and the Fatidas had talked about, everything it had promised to be, at least to MMA fans, a game that could simulate a cage fight like no other before it. Over for it, over for it. What's up? Oh, Rico! Oh, 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 oh. High five, sir. That's one. I couldn't say enough good things about this game, about the people who we built it with, about our partnership with THQ, and it's a game that I'm proud of, and a game that I, I, I am very excited to get into the hands of the fans. And it wasn't just entertaining people, it was teaching them the sport. The game was extremely educational. They really try to educate the fans on the sport of MMA. I think out of any other MMA game that I've played even up until today, I think the Undisputed series did the best job of integrating the multiple different disciplines. It was seamless. Everything flowed like one, one game. It dropped in May 2009, and in its first month, the game sold 1 million units. By February 2010, it had sold 3.5 million. The game offered an authentic UFC experience complete with ring announcements, walkouts, and individual animations and skill sets for each fighter. Them not to mention their focus on individual fighters, making them as unique as possible whether it be their strike animations, their move sets, uh, their locomotion style, their idols. They really paid attention to, to bring in that uniqueness of MMA to the game. Suddenly, the community that had been starved for so long finally had something to rally around. I mean, I just think about all the times I sat there with my friends. We'd all just switch controllers and just run tournaments on THQ. And I can't really do that anymore because I beat the shit out of them. It's something they put a lot of time into. They wanted you to learn about MMA as you play their game. The technical achievements of the game itself were recognized at the 2009 Spike Video Game Awards, where Undisputed took home the title of Best Individual Sports Game. The UFC came out with the most badass throwdown fighting video games of all times. You know, it's where people that like dorks get recognition. No, I'm just kidding, <laughs> but not really. Kind of UFC is up for a uh, one of those monkeys, and uh, I didn't think it was a big deal until I got here. And that's actually one of the cooler awards I've ever seen. They look like me, but more colorful. But the release of Undisputed did not shine on its own for long. As soon as the game hit shelves, there was already another competitor waiting in the wings, one that was looking to take everything that it had worked for. Chapter three: EA versus THQ. THQ had knocked it out of the park with Undisputed, but in the same year, just one month after the release of Undisputed, EA announced their new sports title, EA MMA. It's time for the main event of the evening. Come on, we are swinging for the fences early. Boom, baby! Down he goes! Are you kidding? Joshua Barnes had been working with Dale Jackson and a small team of animators to prove that they could make MMA work, and after several months grinding, the game was officially on its way. And that small team just had a lot of energy and got it greenlit from our initial prototypes. But it was releasing without the licensing of the UFC, so no fighters currently signed to the promotion would feature on its roster, and it wouldn't be supported by the UFC brand. Man, when I heard that EA was going to make their own MMA game but without the UFC license, I I just I didn't think it was going to work. A big reason why MMA was very popular was because of the UFC. For EA to try to make a game without having a lot of those popular fighters in the UFC, I just I didn't think it was it was going to work out. So it was instead stocked with fighters from the likes of Strike Force, but also M1 Global and Dream. We also went after every big name fighter that wasn't in the UFC. We were very aware of that and how to approach those things. The trailer was shown on CBS as part of the Fedor versus Rogers event and showed them fighting in the game before the main event took place. 
It looked fantastic, and it had one thing the UFC game didn't. You could be Fedor, who was still considered by many to be the greatest of all time back in 2009. This announcement sparked an immediate response from Dana, who not only blasted EA, but also any fighters who agreed to join their roster, going so far as to say those fighters would be blacklisted from the UFC. He told media, you told us you'd never be in business with us. They wouldn't even take a meeting because mixed martial arts disgusted them. This wasn't a real sport. Boy, they got over that real quick, didn't they? Peter Moore at EA released a response to Dana publicly. It was much less confrontational and revealed that EA had indeed been working on a concept for an MMA game for a couple of years. But some of the MMA community just weren't buying it and agreed with Dana that it was only being announced as a direct response to the new THQ games and as a competitor after not coming to terms with EA in their initial meetings. Even then, some fans predicted that an eventual EA takeover of the UFC license was inevitable. And even if they didn't see the success the other UFC games had, I think eventually seeing the success the UFC itself had, the growth, I think they would have found a lot of value in it. And it was only a matter of time before EA picked up the game, for sure. But Dana was in full war mode and declared, if there's anybody out there who is a UFC fan, you're fucking nuts if you buy the EA game. All of a sudden, where there was nothing, there were two MMA games in motion looking to one-up each other. That's Dana, right? Like, that's why, we, that's why we love Dana, because he's so competitive. He also wants to put on the best fight with the best fighters out there. So I think that we just kind of expected that from him. He certainly didn't slow down letting guys like Randy or Frank go back and fight in the UFC. Or the Diaz brothers, right? But Dana didn't ban everybody. Randy was still under contract with the UFC when he was on the cover of the game. He stood firm and never signed his likeness over to the promotion, a dispute which had seen him exit the UFC for a while. Well, I didn't actually recently sign. And I signed a year and a half ago with EA. And so when I came back to the UFC, their game was in development. And, and that was obviously a, a negotiating point coming back to the UFC after the contract issues that we had. And they wanted me in the game, but I'd already signed an exclusive deal with EA. And you know, it, it just it, it didn't make sense for EA to, to do that. Other fighters at AKA had tried to do the same, and some were fired while others eventually fell in line. In 2008, the year before, Randy had campaigned the UFC to sign Fedor so he could fight him and unify the UFC and Pride titles. But when they couldn't get Fedor, Randy retired from the UFC so he could go and fight him elsewhere. So when Fedor signed with Strikeforce, Randy quit the UFC. But guess what? The UFC sued him over this and the fight never happened. So the only way to live out the fight was in EA MMA. The game also had a lot of unique features that set it apart from its UFC counterpart. We had specific strikes that the Diaz brothers do, right? They have a different way they, they hold. We had um, yep. locomotion yeah. sets, the way people stood. All all those things when you say how are we doing things you know to compete with UFC is it was authenticity and allowing people to get that detail with their fighters. The one thing that stands out that makes EA MMA unique to me is their vulnerability system. Everything just made sense. You could enter the fight and get knocked out a few seconds and it made sense why. I still play it from time to time and it, it still blows my mind how realistic it is. You know when I first played EA MMA I thought the control system was whack. I hated it that much. When we did go back over, they kept a lot of that button mapping. And you'd think I hated it before, I'd, I'd say, you know, fuck this, let's go back to THQ. But no, it grew on me, and I think they were right the first time, essentially, they had the right idea. What's the flow of, uh, of, of the fight positions? This is really complicated. What happens in, in the clinch or on in, into grappling, you have uh, moves and counter moves. So we would do a flow chart for animation. It's always eight, 10, 12, 24 different kind of like base states. I did this thing <laughs> on, uh, on the computer and I was trying to explain to people how complicated it was. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna print it out. And it was like 118 pieces of paper. There had certainly been a lot of attention to detail, several different promotions and rule sets to fight under and different belts for all those different promotions. Along with the game, it also included a live broadcast feature exclusively streamed inside the actual game where it was the only place to watch it. EA Sports Live Broadcast. Why? Because that's what it is, genius. It's you creating your own fighter using photo game face. It's you fighting for fame and fortune. Broadcast live in thousands of living rooms, skate rooms, and wherever else fans can get their mug in front of the screen. It was hosted by the developers of the game itself and competitors were allowed to cut promos and send in videos which were shown before the broadcast. It was super simple, but it works so well and sowed the seeds for the esports scene and the esports fight league as we know it today. The game itself reviewed well, better than Undisputed 2010 when that was eventually released. But despite the game being announced on CBS and promoted on pay-per-view, no one bought it. 
I think EA MMA wasn't successful because it was $7.99 on the rack a week after it came out. In its first month, it only sold 45,000 copies. Dead on arrival were the words used by investors. And they kept coming back with lower and lower expectations, not because of the game, but because of the market. We, we've missed every projection so far. We've over predicted everything that's come out this quarter. So it was a pretty scary time to be launching any game, much less a new IP for what, I mean, arguably is still an, a niche sport. They didn't have UFC fighters, and not just didn't have UFC fighters, but because they didn't have the UFC brand, the, that UFC name behind them, the game was just, it was always doomed to not do as well as they hoped. Servers shut down two years after the launch of the game because so few people were playing it. It was also released the same time as Fallout New Vegas, one of the best-selling console games of the year. Not only was MMA still smaller than boxing at the time, it kind of was at the about at the plateau. It wasn't going like that anymore. The interest was saturated. saturated. That week, Fallout came out. We began like the biggest recession of the American economy. Uh, what was it? 2000. We were just at the bottom of 2008 crash, right? Without the backing of the UFC, it was indeed a commercial failure. I think three simple letters tell the story. I think uh, UFC. You know, if we have the UFC license, I think our review scores go higher. The reason why. EA wouldn't have picked up that license in the first place. Probably bad luck and timing. I strongly believe that they were meeting with the wrong people. In December 2010, Jeff Ecker confirmed to Figure 4 Online that there was definitely going to be an EA Sports MMA 2, but it never happened. It was then announced that THQ had extended their UFC license to 2018. At the end of it all, Dana had this to say. Let's see how they do now. Their earnings reports just came out and they suck. This company that used to control the video game world and with these big fucking giants, we'll see where they are in the next two years. And as far as the MMA space goes, will kick the living shit out of them. Dana was right that the MMA video gaming space would only continue to grow, but as far as EA not being around in the next two years, well, the reality could not have been more the opposite. Chapter four, the fall of a Titan. So back in 2007, when the UFC signed their deal with THQ, they were one of the biggest players in the gaming market. They ended the year with the highest annual figures ever and net profits from the company, as I said, with revenue in over $1 billion. But by 2011, things had started to change. Since 2007, there had been a dramatic decline across the board in the industry in general. By 2011, video game console sales were down 28%, the lowest they had been since 2005, and the market itself had shifted. If you're a gamer, I'm sure you remember the kind of games that came out. THQ had made a lot of money by creating licensed games for existing franchises, especially movies, especially those that catered to a younger audience. But the gaming world was growing up. We reached a stage where video games were franchises of their own, some of them bigger than movies, and films were starting to be made based on games, not the other way around. In 2011, Bethesda released Skyrim, which conquered the gaming world across all platforms. Activision dropped Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3, which made $1 billion faster than Avatar did in the cinema, and later in the year, they also dropped Black Ops. And EA released Madden NFL 12, Battlefield 3, which all sold incredibly well for a company like THQ with no major franchise titles and no games inside the top 10 sold worldwide amidst the rough waters of the gaming industry, it was only a matter of time before financial troubles appeared on the horizon. Shares had fallen to a dangerously low $1.46 and Evan Wilson, an analyst at Pacific Crest Securities, estimated that THQ had enough cash flow left to keep operations running at current levels for about a year, unless it somehow raised more money. To make things worse, they'd invested a lot of resources in the wrong place places, like the third in the Red Faction series, Armageddon, but it just couldn't compete with the likes of Call of Duty and Battlefield. They'd announced a Warhammer 40k MMO in 2007, which I would still love to see, but they poured over $50 million into it. THQ chief Brian Farrell had the latest release, not wanting to compete with World of Warcraft, but after seven years of development, pulled the plug when they couldn't find a partner to help share the financial burden it had become. They also put a lot of money into a new product called UDraw, a tablet device that connected wirelessly to consoles and you could play drawing games. What are you drawing here? Just a beach. Just a beach? Yeah. You got a little watchtower right there? 
I want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want to be there too. The sales were far less than predicted and it came with an $80 price point with games you had to buy on top of that. In December 2011, they announced that the holiday sales of the U draw had been less than predicted and THQ shares dropped down to just 90 cents. They were now trading under $1 and received a warning from the SEC, the US Security and Exchange Commission. By February 2012, it was reported that THQ had laid off over 240 workers, 17% of its workforce, but even that led to $11 million in severance pay. They were told by the SEC they had until July 23rd to pull their shares above the threshold. In May, Danny Bilson, the executive vice president, left to pursue other interests. Danny had been responsible for Saints Row the Third and the new IP Homefront, which they hoped would turn things around but Danny's qualifications were skeptical. He was best known as a TV show scriptwriter, way more than a games developer. With production costs of 35 to $50 million and tens of millions more to advertise, Homefront was the most expensive game THQ ever produced. They had to sell 2 million copies just to break even. An executive even admitted that it wasn't gonna be easy. The video game market was flooded with similar shooters, games from Activision, Blizzard, Electronic Arts, and even Sony. Since THQ's founding in 1991, licenses from well-known properties helped it become a mid-sized publisher. By 2008, sales of licensed games began to decline as more sophisticated players demanded higher quality titles, as good enough games just didn't cut it anymore. It's a standard desk, nothing special. And not surprisingly, Homefront could not save THQ. They would go on to post a 240 million annual loss in 2012, which was up from 136 million the year before. They had laid off 358 people in two rounds of cuts, but it wasn't enough to turn things around. THQ, as we'd known it back in 2007, was effectively no more, and the dark cloud that loomed on the horizon was well and truly upon them. Chapter five, the war is over. In June 2012, after months of reports of THQ crumbling, Dana White walked out on stage at the E3 press conference to announce a brand new partnership with EA Sports. We're incredibly pleased to announce today the start of a new multi-year, multi-product partnership between EA Sports and the UFC. Now that we've hooked up with the biggest video game company on the planet, this is a huge day for the UFC, a big day for the fighters, and more importantly, for you, the fans. Thank you. Dana was clearly no longer at war with EA, and the partnership that so many fans and media had predicted was finally a reality. There was no way you couldn't have the biggest sports video game company and you know UFC and not have it eventually working together. It was going to happen. Like I said, we kickstarted it with the idea, with the intent of, of proving that we, we could do it. Well, so the UFC probably went back to EA because it's still it's the biggest sports game company by far. I think it's like the same thing as uh, ESPN deal. UFC was on Spike or whatever. They wouldn't turn down going on ESPN now. It was met with tons of excitement from the fans. It was time for a change and expectation was high. I definitely remember when UFC announced their partnership with EA at the E3 convention. And at that time, although we all loved UFC Undisputed 3, the game was kind of getting stale. We needed something new. They dropped a cinematic trailer to showcase what the game might look like and it blew people's minds. The very first scene you saw was GSP walking out and you see GSP in his karate kimono with the, with the headband. And I remember at that time, I was still kind of new to how amazing game graphics can kind of be. And I saw just how lifelike the fighters were. It really, really blew my mind, bro. All excitement I had was just got doubled. And as I'm, I'm looking at this these character models and the way they're moving, the way they're throwing their strikes, my expectations were just through the roof. But on the very same day it was announced EA would be taking over the franchise, THQ also confirmed that they had officially closed their San Diego office for good. The team that had worked on the Undisputed series was gone. Members of the media like Kevin Dent expected it was done to send a message. Dana though released a nice statement about THQ and thanked them. And Brian Farrell of THQ also had his own words appreciating all that they'd achieved over the years together. Only three months earlier THQ Undisputed 3 had been released. Both IGN and GameZone had given it a 9 out of 10 and it had reached number one in the UK software charts for sales but it only sold 1.4 million units and it needed 2 million in order to keep the franchise afloat. Everything EA had learned from EA MMA was going to be translated into this new franchise, along with all that EA could provide in terms of resources and online capabilities. Oh, 100% it makes a lot of sense to me that the UFC you know, would go with EA and they'd provide a better online experience because they're already running FIFA. I think the EA deal with the UFC games was 
probably a good thing. The Undisputed series had played victim to the ever-shifting industry. THQ became a falling pillar that sent ripples throughout the game development world, a spotlight that any company, no matter how big, could eventually fall. But the story doesn't end here. The transition between companies wasn't a quiet one, and THQ were about to bite back at the very people that had taken their franchise. Chapter 6 The Lawsuit The EA UFC partnership had been met with a lot of anticipation and hype from pretty much all sides of the fence. THQ was dead in the water, and by the end of the year, the news broke that they had filed for bankruptcy. By January of 2013, all of its assets were sold off to the highest bidders. Sega bought Relic and would take over the Company of Heroes and Dawn of War franchises. Koch Media picked up the Metro Game series, Homefront and Saints Row, and Take Two acquired the WWE series that still puts out games to this day. But all of a sudden, a lawsuit was dropped on the desk of the District Court in Delaware. It called for action against EA, claiming that they had intentionally ruined the relationship between THQ and the UFC parent company Zufa for their own benefits. During THQ's downfall, they'd met with various companies about acquiring the licenses and development teams under their banners. One of these companies was EA, who they had approached, believing they would be interested in purchasing the UFC license. Supposedly in their meeting with EA, they had revealed their current financial situation, including sales data and marketing projections for the company's UFC video games. EA turned them away, saying they were not interested. THQ were claiming EA then presented this to the UFC and conspired with them, much like getting a fighter out of his contract, to free the UFC license. Just two weeks after meeting with EA, Zufa had sent a letter to THQ saying it wanted to terminate the licensing agreement because of their financial difficulties. Details apparently they could only know about because of EA's meetings with THQ. THQ ended up transferring the license to EA just six months later, right before E3, and about six months after that, they were declaring bankruptcy. Zufa paid THQ $10 million for the termination of their existing agreement and for the license of THQ's UFC related intellectual property. But in the complaint, THQ said they believed at the time the UFC franchise was worth at least $20 million, and likely more than that to EA, but they were unable to bargain because of their financial position. Essentially, THQ said the UFC license changeover was fraudulent under US bankruptcy law that EA, and this is a big word, committed tortuous interference. They wanted them to reverse the transfer, give back the intellectual property or the value of it, and wanted payment for damages. They even wanted profits from the new EA UFC gaming franchise. But what did the UFC have to say about it? Well, nothing. Zufa declined to comment, and no trace of any statement being made can be found. They just publicly ignored THQ's claims. EA themselves refused to make a statement until a few days after the news broke, where they simply responded, we believe these claims are without merit. Most people believe that the lawsuit had just come too late, that they'd have to prove a collusion between the two companies. As a result, the lawsuit was quietly swept away and the remaining bones of THQ were picked clean. So where does that leave us? EA have held on to the UFC license and since 2012 had developed four games in partnership with the UFC. And as for the community that plays them, well, they're still divided. If I had the chance, would I love to see UFC Undisputed 4? Yes, 100%. With all the experience they had, all the brand new technology, that, that sense of, okay, we're gonna get people that will build a game that are genuine, real fans of MMA, I, I, yeah. 100%. I would love to see what they can do again. I think a lot of people think of the THQ games, they say they're better, they're more fun. I'm very fond of those old games, but I actually prefer the new ones. I think they're more fun. I got way more in depth playing online. Regardless of your own choice for the UFC gaming franchise, THQ UFC is well and truly a relic of the past. Much like the dark ages of the sport, it was a victim of a changing industry, and its sudden death wasn't really that sudden at all. The UFC itself was on its last legs before Dana discovered it was for sale and then convinced the Fatida brothers to purchase the three letters which have now become a household name. And with THQ's downfall, EA were in a similar position to step in and lay claim to a beloved franchise that I fear was already far too sunk to be saved. So you're probably wondering, what do I think about this game? Well, it pretty much got me into MMA. I was at university, I just discovered the sport for the first time, and I picked up Undisputed 3. And I learned about the different fighters, about the different moves, how the entire sport worked, basically. 
and it is kind of all thanks to UFC Undisputed 3 that I'm even sitting here right now. After playing the game, I got into training myself and just everything else after that. I think when you love MMA so much, you want to be immersed in the world all the time. I spent so many hours at university playing this game, playing it with my friends, and just being inside the UFC and the world of mixed martial arts. I just wanted to know what happened. What happened to Undisputed? Where did it go? Because it was such an awesome franchise and such a fun game to play. So I guess I wanted to make this video to find out what happened to Undisputed. What happened to one of my favorite video games of all time? It's a question that a lot of you guys have been asking before as well. And so many people still want this game to come back. It's never coming back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but it's never coming back. Getting to make videos like this is part of why I love doing this job so much. And there's a hell of a lot of work that goes into something like this. The research, the script writing, the editing as well. You know, I read a comment on Reddit the other day that said MMA on Point has got 10 to 20 employees. That's not true. There's five of us here, guys, and we do everything we can to make the best videos possible. But if you do want to support this kind of content and these kind of videos or get early access to them or help us make new and creative stuff, you can click join down below. There's absolutely no pressure to do so, but every bit of support from you guys helps a ton. At the end of the day, though, the only thing that matters is what you think, because you are the guys that buy these games. Do you miss Undisputed? Do you hope that the new UFC games can reach the same level or do you prefer EA? I want to know, and that's what the comments are for.